Welcome to the final day of the conference. Well done for making it this far. Um, my name is Catherine Bosworth. I'm the Director of Income Generation and Grants at Hospice UK, and I'll be chairing uh, the session today. Um, for those of you in the room, um, a huge welcome. And um, in terms of questions and things like that, it's the usual Slido, so you can submit your, your questions there. Um, and also a big welcome to everyone joining us online. I believe you can also submit questions on Slido, so um, the instructions should be in your joining instructions. Um, so moving to the session. Um, so we have um, four speakers today. Um, part of the, the general theme for this session is um, collaborative thinking, valuing potential in partnerships and people. And um, the four presentations come from our call for papers. So they're four different abstracts. So we've got our four speakers today. I'll very quickly introduce them, then I'll hand over and we'll do questions at the end if that's okay. So um, first of all, we have Helen Bennett, um, who's the Chief Executive of Pilgrim's Hospice. Um, then we have um, John, Dev uh, John Devlin, Associate Director of Business Development and Partnerships at Greenwich and Bexley Community Hospice. Also um, joining him is Kirsty Humby, and you'll hear more of that later. Um, then we have Mel Nugent, who's the Head of Clinical Education and Practice Development at Marie Curie. And then finally, um, we've got uh, Dr. Joe Brady, who's a consultant in palliative medicine at North London Hospice. Um, so, unless there's anything else, I'll hand over to Helen. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I think everybody must have had a really good night out last night. <laughs> I, you know, I thought this session would be absolutely packed, but there we go. So thank you very much for all getting up early uh, and coming to this session this morning. Um, so my name's Helen Bennett and I'm the Chief Executive from Pilgrim's Hospices in East Kent. And um, I'm really delighted to be with you uh, here this morning to talk to you about the Kent and Medway Hospice Collaboration where we work together to achieve sustainable statutory funding uh, across Kent and Medway. So in today's presentation, um, what I'm going to cover is how we identified the problem, the impact of COVID on our collaboration, what we practically did to be successful, the challenges we faced and the outcome we reached, what actually made the difference to our collaboration and to our success, where we are now and how we're moving forward. So the Kent and Medway uh, hospice collaboration emerged in January 2021 and this really came about because we all worked quite closely through COVID. So we were having conversations about our financial situations, our challenges, our financial deficits. So, and at that point, we probably realized as it was through COVID that our voice was gonna be stronger together. Um, so we came together and we also used the Future Vision Programme, the nine principles of sustainability that NHS England supported with KPMG uh, and Hospice UK, because in there actually there's a really good description of hospices being sustainable for the future. And some of those principles increasing our statutory funding, collaborative working, integration, data, they were all relevant to us and how we were going to approach the problem we had. And I know since 2021, lots of hospices um, have undergone this journey, but two years ago, this was quite new. We weren't being encouraged or forced by our systems to work together, but we knew there was a strength in coming together. So the problem that we were trying to get our arms around, we knew that there was a need for sustainable funding for our core and specialist services. We needed to develop our charitable enhanced services, but a lot of our funding actually goes towards our inpatient units and not as much on our charitable activities and our enhanced services as what we would like. We had a soaring cost base. I think everybody in this room recognises pay, trying to stay in line with the NHS, energy costs, food, everything was increasing, everything but our hospice grants. Um, Previous discussions with individual CCGs had not been fruitful. And when I'd spoken to various chief execs, they would say to me, they would go along, and I'm using the term CCG because that's predominantly who we spoke to through this, although I know it's ICBs now. Um, but they would go along to their CCG and they'd say, you know, we really need more money for our services. And the CCG would say, we love our hospices and we love what you do, but we haven't got any more money to give you. And then they'd say, oh, well, thanks ever so much for having that conversation and would try to keep continuing what they were trying to do. 
Um, relationships with commissioners have been varied. So even the conversations that we had across East Kent, West Kent, Medway, it was all very, very varied. Um, there was a change in health and social care landscape across Kent and Medway. We knew that was coming. We knew there was a need for a strong, unified hospice voice. And there was also a need to contribute to the development of the CCG's five-year end-of-life uh, palliative and end-of-life care strategy, which we did. Now, I think a few speakers, I think Jason Leith mentioned this on the first day, have spoken about the impact of COVID because it was a really awful time for a lot of organisations. You know, and we recognise that. But for us, what it meant is that we had really close working with the CCG during COVID. Um, certainly for pilgrims, um, we had twice daily NHS system calls where we actually sat with all the other big providers to see how we could play our part. And at this table, we were really able to demonstrate our value and expertise. As a result of that, um, a multi-provider strategic Kent and Medway end of life care group was established, which is doing some great work, which supports this uh, funding issue going forward. We developed a Kent and Medway education collaboration group. I know a lot of hospices did that. We have got a poster uh, in the hall, if anybody is passing. Um, and we collaboratively provided end-of-life care COVID guidance, treatment escalation plans, care home education. And the ultimate outcome of this was that it really enhanced the Kent and Medway hospice profile at this time in a way that we'd never, we'd, our profile had never been raised before uh, with statutory services. So what did we actually do? I really gave some thought, and I'm delighted to have, I should say, Rachel Street, who is the Chief Executive of the Heart of Kent here today as well. What did we actually do um, to increase our funding with um, the CCG? We sat down, we planned a joint approach. We had clarity on the outcome we were looking for. We set ground rules. We had really open and honest conversations, and we built trust and some of you might be familiar with a model, it's called the four G's model. Um, and really, you have to really work out what are you prepared to give in your collaboration? What do you wanna get? What might you have to give up? And what might you have to get over? And I sort of reflect on the work that we're doing at the moment. We all can't lead on everything. I might, you know, do the initial drafts of the letters to the ICB. Rachel will really focus on, you know, technical mapping, financial templates. So, you know, you sort of have to think, well, I might not have written it that way, or I might not have done it that way. What are you prepared to give up or get over when you're collaborating together? So we shared tasks, as I've just mentioned, who could do what, um, and we identified our individual strengths and experience as chief executives, because many of us were new or interim. And I really think we gave a different energy to the problem we were trying to solve, because maybe we're, we were new. Um, we shared sensitive information regarding funding and activity. And that's really difficult for hospices, because you know, people feel uncomfortable doing that. And we built a united front, but we retained our individuality, which I know is important. We also gave a clear message to the CCG. The average funding we get in Kent and Medway is about 20% of the national average, um, where nationally it's 33%. And actually the CCG were quite receptive to this message. We presented our activity and funding data to evidence our case. And what I would say here, good data was a real struggle for us. It's the one area I think we really know we've got to have good, consistent data that will influence commissioners. And I think through our strategic clinical networks, we're working with them to say, what data do you need? What does it look like? How can you support us to make sure we've got the systems that we need and we've got a consistency? We used early drafts of the NHS Commission Intentions Framework document. Um, so it's now been published, but when that first draft came out, we, we had it, we were mapping our services, we were understanding our costs, sorry, <coughs> I should have brought some water up. Um, we, um, but because we wanted to give the CCG an idea of actually um, what our service costs and how the contribution mapped towards that. We held the CCG to account on meeting dates, decisions, timelines, activity, you know, and we really did hold their feet to the fire. And I remember sitting in one meeting and, and Wendy, our director of nursing, is in the room as well. And really, 
you know, not letting them wriggle off what they said they'd do. And uh, Wendy le leaned into me and said, you know, I think they're just going to give us some money to go away soon. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it might not have been in our original plan and strategy, but I think it, it, we learned from that, really. Um, so we were explicit as well about uh, the impact on services and patients. And we were really explicit that services would be withdrawn. And I've spoken to a lot of people about this because um, some of you will have heard the term moral distress, especially for people working in hospices. We want to do everything we can for our patients, our families that we care for. We keep going. It puts staff under a lot of stress because the last thing we want to do is not deliver. But actually, you cannot continue to run services that you cannot afford. So you have to be really explicit about that. And we were. And it was a really big lever with the CCG. And we were very clear that our operational deficits, which we'd shared, were unsustainable and reserves for some of our hospices were limited. So what were the challenges? There were plenty. We had to build trust as chief executives and boards. There were differences in working styles. There's still differences in working styles now. Um, concern about becoming too reliant on NHS funding. Possible loss of hospice independence. And I'm sure others are experiencing this in the room now, but our senior leaders in the NHS kept being shuffled. So you would build up relationships, you'd get a really good understanding, and then the next thing you'd say, oh no, they're off now, they've got a job in IT. And you're like, great, we've got to start all over again. So we kept having to repeat our case. Um, and I think I mentioned the challenge around data, you know, really robust activity and quality data as evidence, you know, and we're looking at various different types of data that we can use consistently, such as Oak, as we go forward. And the other big challenge which could have easily derailed us from this at that time was COVID, because we all operationally had day-to-day -day services that we had to manage. So what was the outcome? So we secured a million pounds additional funding uh, for this year, and that's for four of the hospices that you can see um, uh, on the slide. Two of the hospices in there, Demelza and Wisdom Hospice, they've got different funding models, but actually the Kent and Medway Collaborative is one group, and they were able to give their insights and wisdom, even though they weren't directly, um, you know, they wouldn't benefit from the additional funding. And we also secured a commitment to review longer term funding in line with the uh, Commission Intentions Framework and the strategy of the CCG. And that was really important because I would say this year and next year, we're really going to have to, it's really tactical funding, I think, before we get to sort of proper contracts, proper sustainable uh, funding. Um, but we really want that commitment for them to do that. So we were very explicit. So what made the difference, I would say? Be strategic have a plan, have a really clear plan when you start. Speak with one voice and use each other's strengths. Being well-respected, uh, credible expert providers, we've all got really strong reputations and a strong brand, and we demonstrated that through COVID. Being brave enough to talk about withdrawing services, hugely uncomfortable, but I think it was a real driver. Um, and really being assertive and tenacious, not getting distracted, by so many other things that could knock you off course. So where are we now? I did actually think what I should have put on this slide is a picture of Jerry Maguire, you know, show me the money. <laughs> I, really, I really feel maybe I, I missed a trick there, but we're negotiating again. Um, but we've got all that experience to draw on. Uh, our relationships are built and secure as a chief exec team. Um, so, what I would say, we're establishing our relationships with the ICB really quickly. We've got a new chief executive there. In fact, apart from the finance director, which I think is quite helpful, everybody else is new. Um, so we are escalating our case uh, to the ICB. We put all the background and a lot of information in, I think just last week or the week before, um, really demonstrating our value and expertise. Um, we've got some new service developments, so I know a lot of people will be working on similar things, but we're working very closely with primary care and the ICB right across Kent and Medway on the early identification of those at the end of life, making sure they've got the plans they need, single point of access, because what's really clear at the moment, and the message I'm getting, and some of you might be getting it too, is that um, there is no new money. I think there will be pots of money, but they're saying there will be no new money. 
and that you're going to have to show disinvestment from other services, whether that's unnecessary admissions to the acute trust, the ambulance service with um, you know, multiple trips for those at the end of life, because actually they haven't been identified, they haven't got a care plan. So actually, you know, these new service developments, you know, as well as um, running our our day-to-day -day services are really important, but they need funding. Um, so we are influencing them to see palliative and end-of-life care as a priority for the ICB. The messages I'm getting at the moment is you must get your case on the table. There's so many priorities uh, for the ICB that it's going to be easy to miss a small service because our funding in relation to the whole ICB funding is quite small. So do all you can um, to get yourself seen as a priority. And next week, we've got the medical director who's responsible for palliative and end-of-life care coming for a visit to the heart of Kent. We're also going to take her through, again, the funding challenges. We've had a one-to-one -one with her on Teams, but we're building that relationship quickly. And one of the things she said to me, which is really helpful, and I mentioned it to another chief exec last night, is that they're actually bringing um, palliative and end-of-life care services together with ageing well uh, and frailty. So actually, there's going to be much bigger pots of money, maybe for commissioners to, to look at, which I think is helpful. And we are being very clear, again, on our financial positions and the withdrawal of services if necessary. We're not changing that message because, you know, certainly, you know, our board um, will not allow us and other boards to continue spending money that we haven't got. So in summary, what I would say, have a clear plan of what you want to achieve. Use your collective strengths across your systems. Use your brand and your reputation. As I say, we've all got strong brands and reputations. Build your relationships quickly. Use good data to back up your costs and your quality of services. And above all, be brave. So I have worked with Nikki Vasco, who I know she's here somewhere. Uh, hi, Nikki. So Nikki has written a case study which has gone live today on this piece of work if you want some more information. Um, but apart from that, thank you very much for listening to me and um, happy to take questions at the end. That came. Brilliant. Thank you. thank you, Helen. John and Kirsty, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for choosing this particular session to come along to. We're going to explore the challenges of fitting two of us onto a small podium, I think, through this presentation. <laughs> um, so I'm John. I work at Greenwich and Bexley Community Hospital, where I am the Associate Director of Business Development and Partnerships. When I looked at the delegate list online, my job title took up the most space. Um, I'll introduce Kirsty. Kirsty can introduce herself as well. Yeah, morning everyone. My name is Kirsty Humby. It's really lovely to be here with you all this morning. And yeah, we're going to talk to you about an experience that we've both shared that I think really um, highlights the value of collaboration and partnerships on many different levels, um, which is the Darcy Fellowship Programme. Which is this one. Okay, so first of all, let me introduce you to this gentleman here. This is Lord Ara Darzi. I don't know if you've heard of him. Um, if you want to be both simultaneously inspired and intimidated by someone's achievements, I suggest you Google him. Uh, Lord Darzi is um, a surgeon, he's an academic, and he's also worked with um, the government in politics um, around policy. And this, he's the kind of the inspiration for the Darzi Fellowship. Um, so back in the mid-2000s, uh, mid he um, carried out a review, high, high Quality Care for All, and the Darcy Fellowship was a response, really, from this review that kind of, it called for stronger clinical leadership and management roles in the NHS um, in terms of thinking about how that could drive forward quality. So really then, what is the Darcy Fellowship? So the Darcy Fellowship is a one-year programme that has two components to it. So the first side, there's an academic component. So it's open to, um, it's a leadership programme that's open to NHS um, clinicians from across all professions. 
and the academic side of it um, for me was hosted by London South Bank University and you get to sit in a classroom with lots of other professionals and learn about things like the core concepts of quality, innovating systems, leading through change, and really having a chance to kind of step back and think about kind of current literature, methodologies, new models of care, lots of different things, really unpacking the work that as clinicians you're kind of doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And then the other side of the programme is the really exciting part, actually, is about then you kind of go into a workplace setting. So for me, that was um, working with the hospice. And you get to really put all this stuff that you're learning um, in the classroom into practice. So, and you do that via um, a kind of a complex um, change initiative, um, which John will tell you more about. Um, so, yeah, thinking about how, yeah, you can... Under, learn and understand and kind of work through some of these things that you're learning about kind of through the real work because we often know that the kind of the classroom stuff is going to be often the theory can be quite different to the reality of actual what it's like in the workplace oh sorry I've gone the wrong way Okay, so in terms of what motivated me to kind of um, take on this, this um, Dardy fellowship was um, prior to working I, at, at the, as the on the Darcy, I was um, managing a very busy kind of community mental health team for people with psychosis in South London, um, which and I loved that job. It was a really rewarding job, but there wasn't really any opportunity or often time really for me to think about my own personal development outside of just kind of struggling to get my mandatory training done every year in time for my appraisal. And so I kind of made that conscious decision that I wanted to look for opportunities to really explore how I could become a stronger leader, you know, clinical leader and system leader, which is what kind of led me to looking into the Darcy Fellowship. And this is like our dating experience, <laughs> explaining our origin story. But at the same time, at the hospice, we were working on a complicated multi-partner social care collaboration that sounds incredibly grand I'll explain it in a second um, and felt that we needed some sort of extra support to help us with some wicked problems of which there were many um, so the background to why we collaborated with um, the HIN is that we've always worked closely with the health innovation networks so they are the academic health science network in South East, in South London um, so we agreed to jointly host a Darcy fellow and um, we advertise our placement so the Darcy fellow who, who was Kirsty um, spent two days a week working with us at the hospice um, in our One Bexley project, two days working with the HIN, and there was a day a week um, for academic study. We interviewed jointly and um, appointed Kirsty and her placement ran from September 21 to August 22. So I will, a quick um, shift of focus, because, because One Bexley, just to give you the context of about Kirsty's, Kirsty's work, so, Greenwich and Bexley Community Hospice, so in South East London, I've been really London centric, aren't I? I assume you all know where Bexley is. It's, it's right on the border of South East London, pushing up against um, the Dartford Crossing and the Kent border. So, a consortium of Bexley based charities, who we're collectively now calling One Bexley, um, have been working together for a few years to explore how we could all work differently and, and support people. So, it's, it's our local Age UK, it's our, our local MenCap. Um, the only organisation who's perhaps not self-evident is Inspire, who are a community equipment provider for people with sensory um, issues. And all our pretty logos and colours and our new One Bexy logo in the middle. Um, what we are doing, what this has evolved into, is working with the local authority um, and being led by the hospice. We are delivering care act assessments for people. Um, so I'm not going to um, spend too much time on this slide. I'm sure you're, all, you're familiar with the CARE Act and, and eligibility criteria, but these are the kinds of people we're working with. So across these eight organisations, we're employing trusted partners who are employed in the third sector who are carrying out CARE Act assessment, carer assessments and reviews for people with non-complex needs. We could spend an hour talking about what non-complex means, but non-complex. Um, these trusted partners are identifying eligibility for Care Act support, but actually if people are referred who don't meet those criteria, they're able to provide information and guidance um, from their, within their own organisations, but also learning about the organisations locally who aren't part of our collaborative. They're then working with that individual to put in place uh, personalised support so people can meet their needs, taking a real strength-based approach, so able to refer perhaps arrange personal carers, but also refer people to local voluntary sector services or lunch clubs, those kinds of things. With the work being carried out by local organisations, and we're really excited in a couple of weeks, the hospice will be employing one of these assessors. Um, it's, 
people are working with people they know already, so we're breaking down some of the stigma around accessing social care. It gives us a real um, our early data showing access to groups who perhaps haven't historically been very comfortable working with people. We're going to a council and asking for an assessment. Um, very brief timeline of where we are. So I was trying to get through this presentation without saying COVID, but <laughs> we're always going to have these stars against 2020, aren't we? So we, we started delivering activity in October 2020 um, in a pilot phase, which was extended. It was the, the logistics of home-based people, a lot of them in smaller charities, learning complicated council systems remotely. Um, we bid and were successfully awarded a contract in October 21, um, which is for 2.6 million over three years. We've just, we're sort of in the second phase, this contract we've just started with an aim of supporting around 2,900 people each year. That's the background, the more interesting stuff is Kirsty's experience, I think, with us. <laughs> Okay, so just to kind of very briefly give a bit of background to myself, I'm an occupational therapist by profession and my background was working in mental health. So I've worked for about 12 years in mental health services um, in the community in South London. Um, so when I stepped into the, the One Bexley work as part of my Darcy Fellowship, like John said, they kind of had come to the end of this one year pilot and had just been awarded this three year um, contract from the council. So I guess like the work that I was allowed to do was I mean, it's actually quite scary for me, really, because I suppose I've been used to kind of working in a, a team, being incredibly reactive, you know, firefighting all the time. And suddenly I was given this opportunity to stop and think and really reflect. And I just I was like a fish out of water. I had no idea. I had all this time just to talk to people and you know, really understand the context of what was going on. So often a lot of the work was just having conversations with people to to really understand, you know, what was one Bexley? Um, you know, so this was the first experience I'd ever had of working with the charity sector and also more closely with local authority. I was very much kind of NHS kind of, that's how I had been raised throughout my career, kind of within the NHS kind of structure. So throughout that work, um, you know, I was obviously working with John and John encouraged me to kind of think about Okay, so we've been doing this work for a year, kind of maybe what's missing in terms of the taking this forward for the next three years, what do we need to kind of be focusing on and, and how that kind of linked in with my work on the, the academic side of the programme. So um, I took an interest in co-production and I, I'm sure that throughout the, the conference there's been lots of talk about co-production and really working with people and families who use <laughs> our services and so that was something that I felt maybe could be um, brought more into the One Bexley work. So I know obviously this this um, project isn't necessarily the hospice core business, but what I think is so interesting, so my reflections and learning on this, what I think is so interesting was immediately I was like thrown into this world where my eyes were completely opened in a way that they never had been before. Like I said, I was very much kind of NHS, mental health, community focused. So having this, I was suddenly in this really privileged position to understand a bit more and think a little bit more about the system, the wider system that I worked within you know, and in England, we're now working in integrated care boards, you know, sort of in partnership across health, social care and charity sectors. But kind of really, what does that mean? And actually what it gave me an opportunity to do was to really challenge some of my unconscious bias, actually, that I didn't realise I had around things like, you know, clinicians versus non-clinicians and who can do this work and how can we work together? So it's just an opportunity to really step outside of my bubble and really think more, more, just wider, broader, that I had never had the opportunity to do before. And I think, you know, we're all busy people. We all kind of work in um, often highly sort of stressful environments. And I think sometimes, even though we're working with people and um, people and relationships are our work, often not so much what we do can become really transactional. So one of my biggest reflections over this year is really the power of relationships and the power and the importance of building relationships and networks. I know, Helen, you were kind of alluding to this, but and I know it sounds really simple, but I think I was given this opportunity to really intentionally think about that and think about who am I building relationships with and why, you know, what networks am I in you know, and why. Um, and I think there's something there about not just sort of sitting in an echo chamber, not just sitting in this kind of world where often we when we're stressed and we're busy, it's kind of like you can create like an us and them kind of like, oh, it's not my team, it's not my team, that's the issue, it's them. And, you know, but actually really trying to understand the wider context that you work in and really understand the challenges around that. But also I think about 
a big thing for me was understanding the diversity of people that I was speaking to, like whose voices am I hearing, whose voices am I really not hearing and why. So something about intentional relationships, intentional networks, and but also thinking about how then it's my responsibility to you know, create links for other people. So what I've definitely understood more is innovation can really happen when there's all these different types of conversations going on. And like the work that, you know, the hospice are doing, there's so many partnerships being, you know, created there with local authority, with other charities, within the Health Innovation Network, with academic institutions. So it's kind of all these different levels of partnerships and then thinking about the co-production. So we did lots and lots of work about co-production and, and how that might then potentially influence the work that the hospice is doing in terms of how their kind of co-production works. So I suppose it's really made me think about, you know, how do I disrupt the system a little bit more? How do I ask questions? You know, well, why are we doing this? And what's the value? What's the actual value to the people who are using our services? And what do they think about it? What's their voice? So I don't think any of... I'm trying to think about the reflections that can kind of be universal to kind of, you know, the, you know, the audience here today. But I think sometimes taking the opportunity to think really intentionally about those things, which we don't often have in our day-to-day -day work. So I think, like I say, it was a massive, massive privilege, but that's now even it doesn't matter how busy i am even in my new role it's thinking about how can i create the space for these conversations for this innovation to happen for this diversity of people coming together i think that's something that we could all really reflect on in our day-to-day -day lives and what partnerships can we form that will help us you know do things differently because i think the reality is there's, there's never going to be lots more money but we can't keep doing the same things and expecting different results so it's kind of how can we yeah bring in new ways of working that's probably some of my reflections so just to sort of, I think I wanted just to finish off, this is a stretch for a hospice to be working in adult social care, supporting people who aren't at the end of life. So I thought it was just worth sharing why, we, why we've why we gone down this path. So I think what um, and Kate's in the room, who's the Chief Executive of Greenwich University, I think, I think a big reflection for me is there are lots of, uh, and this has come through in the conference actually, we aren't the only people who support people at the end of life and actually a vibrant voluntary sector supporting all kinds of people with all kinds of needs. The people who we see are accessing support before they access hospice care. Their carers are accessing support afterwards. So actually the role that we've taken, hopefully being able to strengthen our local sector, you know, the, the, some of the charities we're working with, we always feel as hospices that we're small compared to the NHS, but in Bexley we are massive compared to a small organisation with a turnover of a couple of hundred thousand who doesn't have an HR department or a finance manager. So we've actually done quite a lot of mentoring, sharing ideas and learning, I should have written learning here, but learning from them as well about their challenges and be able to make sure there's a robust service sector that wraps around people. I think um, we have supported and enabled cultural change with the local authority. There are a lot of us here who go to meetings that we kind of think, why are we here? Um, but I think my reflection is we go to meetings around quite technical social care stuff, but we are the, the allies in the council are using us as the Trojan horses to try and affect change from within. And I think that's a really important role for all of us with the NHS, with local authorities, whoever we're working with. Um, it's really also strengthened by that link with the local authority. It's really helped us as a hospice grow our role in the integrated care system. I think we are the integrated care system as well. It's not them and us we are the integrated care system now so the more we can do to kind of be really visible and and take our place there is important and Kirsty was has done some really great work so you know supporting a small project with co-production actually the learning will be something that we use with our core hospice business as well um so key learning key reflections um think about academic fellowships they're great and i think think about them in those perhaps most hospices I would imagine use students various placements for more clinical roles but actually in that system development space it's, it's really valuable we've bet we've benefited immensely from Kirsty's expertise both in terms of this project but she's an experienced OT she's done lots of work and you know had conversations with our AHP team the fellowship itself was really generously structured so I was invited to a number of modules um, it's a whole other session, but some of those training courses are the training courses that you remember, you know, they're, they're, they were really good and it was really, you know, it, there was crossover benefit for us. It's well regarded locally, um, the, the programme's well regarded locally. So when we're working with partners, somebody who's from a well-respected qualification, that really gave us a bit of heft in some of those conversations. And this is a very localised project. It's at London South Bank. There's probably no one else in the room who falls under their catchment. Um, 
but have a look have a look around see what's out there it's worth thinking about and we would wholeheartedly encourage you to think about these about these so thank you very much can I just oh, sorry? Sorry, can I just add? So, so as John was talking, there were just two more things I just really wanted to share. And um, just to say that since I finished my Darcy Fellowship in August, I've gone on and I'm now working for the Integrated Care Board in South East London. And actually, a really big part of my work now is now I, now I know more about the charity sector. It's like I can't forget that you know, that that's there. And I think it's so I take the responsibility now to think about how I can promote and include you know, not just the NHS, not just my local authority colleagues, but the whole, you know, all the kind of the local charities and voluntary sector organisations as well, which has been so important for me. And it's my responsibility to kind of advocate and bring, make sure that those organisations are being brought into the discussion, which I sometimes worry about perhaps might not always take place. But the other thing I think that this um, fellowship has given me an opportunity to do, particularly, sorry to say it, since COVID and working across, you know, years that are really difficult for all of us, it was just really nice to have the opportunity to be inspired and look to leaders that really inspire me because often I don't necessarily think we think about that so much in our day-to-day -day jobs but you know like John and Kate are really inspirational leaders and I think that's just really nice sometimes to think about who is it at work that inspires you and why and how can you make those connections with them so I just wanted to also extend my thanks to Kate and John for a really amazing experience. And I'm going to have one last jump in can you applause <laughs> when you if you choose to applause us <laughs> Kirsty left her graduation yesterday very early to get on a flight to be with us so if we could all give First, your round of applause for graduating. Thank you. Thanks so much. Mel. Melanie, over to you. Welcome. with us a sec. Thank you. So hi, I'm Mel. I'm the Head of Clinical Education and Practice Development at Marie Curie. I am going to be looking at a lot of my notes because I'm condensing three years of work into 12 minutes. <laughs> so um, the vision for our career development progression framework is to provide a clear pathway for career progression and staff development in Marie Curie and to support the organisation in building staff capability. So our goal is to enable our clinical teams to meet future challenges through individual development and organisational learning. So the purpose of the framework um, is to enable further understanding of our roles, our skill mix and the different levels of practice to support workforce development, recruitment, retention, workforce planning and evidencing of high quality standards of care and to support the work we're doing around the strategic review of pay and benefits. So um, during phase one of the program, this ran from May to October in 2019. Uh, we used a values clarification model to identify the ultimate purpose for guiding our career and competence framework. So we looked at what the purpose of Marie Curie is, uh, the purpose of people using Marie Curie services, and what is the societal purpose as well. So we uh, co-facilitated four countrywide national workshops with a research team, which was UEA and Impact Research, and the practice development facilitators we had within the organisation. And out of this came our shared visions and values and also a draft implementation and impact framework. Alongside this, our research support team also undertook a literature review. And we've also aligned our um, emergent capabilities with the Skills for Health Career Framework of the NHS. And this is to enable mobility and mutual recognition moving to and from the NHS and Marie Curie. Um, two domains of practice were identified. One was around direct palliative care, and the second one was around leadership, quality, innovation, practice development, and culture. So an outcome approach to capabilities which focus on actions in the workplace, which are underpinned by understanding, know-how, and shared values. We tested this then at a quality improvement conference that we held um, in Edinburgh, and this was with practitioners of all levels. And then this was refined and reported um, during phase one of our project. Whoop. During phase two, um, 
I was going to mention COVID. I think everyone knows about COVID, so I'm not going to really go into that. But we can see that this put quite a hold on the work we were doing. We didn't pick this back up then until um, November 2020. So because of the C word, we used a lot of um, interactive elements to this phase of our work. Um, so we developed staff webinars to showcase the project of where we were and what we were hoping to progress with. And through this, frequently asked questions were developed. Um, we also had short life working groups for levels of practice from two through to eight. And there was a representative of practitioners as well as line managers on that as well. And that was to make sure that the language that we were using was appropriate to the levels of practice and also aligning the core clinical skills along with the capabilities. We also created a self-assessment tool with practitioners, and that was to accompany the framework and was to be used with um, my plan and review, which is Marie Curie's appraisal process. Um, during the pilot, we had um, two participants. So we had Hampstead Hospice, and it was um, their band threes and fours that participated. And then we had the Northwest, which is a community service team as well. So using realist evaluation, uh, the steering group uh, wanted to understand the strategies and questions that may enable and facilitate capacity for implementation. So this included what strategies work best and why when practitioners use the career framework for self-assessment, what strategies work for who and why when implementing the framework when transforming services around the patient journey, what learning development and improvement strategies work for embedding the career framework across the organisation? And what metrics can we use to measure impacts of embedding an integrated approach to career development and system transformation across the workforce in Marie Curie? We also were looking at aligning the career framework to learning and teaching strategies and wider strategic change to support the workforce. I did it again. So during phase three of the program, we piloted the self-assessment tool again with um, Hampstead, Northwest, Scotland and the Midlands. And this phase of the project ran from September 2021 to 2022. Um, so once again, we linked it through to the appraisal process. Um, we had internal facilitators that were trained to be able to pro provide support on a one-to-one -one basis or through group sessions, and this was through every level of practice. However, we did have some challenges with getting engagement with some Band 5 and Band 6 practitioners, and I think that's because, obviously, the timing of it all. Um, we did have issues with staffing, like most people did as well during this period of time, and also it was about not impacting on care delivery. We used claims, concerns and issues framework to gather feedback on the process, the language, the capability levels, the knowledge, clinical skills and understanding. And feedback has been used to inform the revisions. So whilst aligning the capabilities with knowledge, understanding and know-how, some gaps were identified and language relating to this will be tested during phase four, which is our implementation. And the engagement with staff in co-production of this framework has shown the power of collaboration and the engagement with this as well. So to be an employer of choice, we need to value staff, their voice, and actively engage with and work with people and not do to. Co-creation has enabled this. Um, and reflecting on Jason's session, we have continually refined this framework in practice with practitioners. Our approach is using um, co-creation, person-centeredness and practice development, which we feel has enabled this. We have had challenges, <laughs> which I've touched on. Um, the pandemic, wide-scale systemic changes within Marie Curie. Um, keeping this on the top of list of competing priorities has been quite challenging as well. And staffing, so turnover, recruitment, long-term sickness absence, and also at times shielding when the pandemic as well, because we had a number of staff that were shielding at the time. So this is some of the feedback we've had from our practitioners in phase three. So a lot of it has been positive. Um, and then we're moving into phase four, which is our implementation. 
So we do have two early adopter sites which will be undertaking this between November this year and the end of January 2023, and these sites are Scotland and Midlands, so they've been involved in this since phase two. Um, we've also recruited two clinical facilitators to support the implementation, embedding and evaluation of the project. In collaboration with our brilliant online L&D manager, Helen Gordon, we have developed a self-assessment tool and personal development plan that will sit online on our L&D platform. And we have aligned self-assessment to the Stoneacre and Bell's Taxonomy of Skills Acquisition. So this has been embedded in our clinical education, training and assessment framework. So there is a consistent self-assessment grading tool in relation to clinical education and training across the organisation. So using the online tools will allow managers, uh, place-based leadership teams and national clinical education teams to be able to pull off data um, around any development needs. So I've heard a lot over the last couple of days about survey fatigue and why are we doing surveys? What's the point of them? What are we hoping to get out of them? We are hoping that engaging in this way will reduce the um, unnecessary amount of surveys that we do as far as training needs assessments as well. That's not to say there's not a place for them, but I think if we can automate some of the processes as well, and if we are actually engaging in the process um, of uh, annual reviews, which is also about touching base with staff throughout the year. I don't think necessarily the, the survey once a year to work out what your training plan is going to be for the year is necessary. So we've also developed education pathways. So far we've done level two and level five practitioners, which are the majority of our clinical nursing workforce. And this pathway starts from recruitment, which we're using values based through to 12 to 18 months in post, where people um, may be reflecting on whether to stay within their current role and continue on their personal development, or to explore what progression opportunities are available. We have aligned education available to knowledge, understanding and know-how in the career framework, and part of the implementation will be understanding where there may be gaps in provision of education. So staff in the early adopter sites were sent a survey with four distinct um, sections. The career pathway, so to help us understand um, the extent to which Marie Curie had enabled development and career progression. The clarity of role, um, to help the implementation understand, the team to understand um, how much people understood of their role, their responsibility, and also their influence around the larger team, because I don't think people understand that they do have influence over the larger team as well, and that was picked up through the survey. Um, L&D, so the extent to which learning and development, the environment we've created and whether that is enough to help people to learn and to grow. And staff support and retention. So the extent to which we've successfully supported um, and engaged staff with people to feel valued at Marie Curie. So these results were shared with staff in the early adopter sites and over 70% of staff surveyed in Midlands said they planned on working for Marie Curie in five years time and 63% of staff in Scotland said the same. So this will also provide a benchmark for us to use during our implementation. A line manager survey was sent out as well. I know I just said about not sending surveys to people too, it's a bit of an oxymoron. Um, <laughs> um, and some of the results of that came back. So we've created a community of practice and the feedback from that survey has informed that curriculum. Um, so the first session was held on the 14th of November and that's through Microsoft Teams and we'll have another few sessions before the end of the implementation. So we'll start evaluation of our early adopter sites in January. Um, and we're also looking, sorry, to work with our AHP colleagues and social work colleagues um, early next year because this is very nursing and healthcare assistant focused. Um, so that work will start next year and then we'll also follow on with some support work for our clinical support staff and also our volunteers as well. So this is a little snapshot of um, the detail we go into with our career development framework. Um, at the start, I mentioned about strategic review of pay and benefits, um, and we're currently in the process of aligning all of our community staff onto Agenda for Change pay scales. Previously, they'd been on Marie Curie banding. Um, we've aligned all of our job descriptions to the career framework so that staff with the same role will now be on the same job description because being such a large organisation, 
There's lots of varieties of job descriptions out there. Um, and we envisage that understanding of skill mix, which will happen when using the career framework, will also inform and influence the future workforce design. So next steps, we're currently in the process of writing for publication. We've got the evaluation of our early adopters, organisational rollout, working with our AHP and social work colleagues um, from some, summer 2023. Um, we've also in the process of developing a return to practice program because through the staff survey, we've identified six healthcare assistants that would like to return to practice as registered nurses. We're also in the midst of developing a preceptorship program to support newly qualified nurses into the organisation. We are also um, starting communities of practice for trainee nurse associates and nurse associates next year. Um, and I guess, given the context of going together, if anyone in any of the other hospices would also like to join us, we're happy to open up that to anybody that would like to join as well, because we don't really have big numbers of trainee nurse associates or nurse associates at the moment. And I think it is about learning and growing with each other. Um, and the last thing that we're doing is participating in the Nursing Now Challenge with an emphasis on our student nurses and nurse associates that we employ. And just a thank you. So the top group is the project and steering group, um, but we wouldn't be where we are without all of the staff that have helped co-create this. So I just wanted to acknowledge their engagement and contributions because they're highly valued. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mel. Over to you, Jo. Thank you. So I'm very aware that they say you can only stay focused for 45 minutes, and we're probably <laughs> hitting that point. So I'm going to be really evil and ask everyone to just stand up just for a minute. Sorry, I am that person. And just, you know, shake it out, what have you. OK. Just because I really want you to listen. <laughs> because like everyone who's already spoken, I'm really passionate about our project and all the four things we've done so far. You can sit down now. Thank you. <laughs> I won't make you stand for the whole 15 minutes. Um, so I'm Jo Brady, I'm a consultant in palliative medicine and I work at Barnet Hospital in North London and I work for the North London Hospice in the community and I'm passionate about lots of things. Um, I'm really passionate about frailty because when I first moved to, into my consultant post I thought what will be my thing, what will be my area of interest and then I got a job at Barnet and everybody is frail and elderly so it became my thing whether I liked it or not. And then I'm really lucky that I work alongside some amazing geriatricians who are really passionate about end of life care. And so along with them, together we became really passionate about frailty and education. And then I think because I work in a split role, I work in the hospital, I work in the community, I see the world from both sides. So I'm actually really passionate about trying to get everyone to talk to each other and collaborate at a clinical level, at an organisational level, at an educational level. And finally, I'm passionate about games, Jenga in particular. I challenge any of you to a game of Jenga. I get better as I get more um, lubricated. <laughs> so that's the backdrop for why I ended up, or how I ended up playing Jenga with my paramedic colleagues and how I hope it will improve end of life decision making. Oh. Ah, there we go. So this presentation is focusing on collaboration. That was the key word for this, for this section. And it was a collaboration between various providers across various care settings. And we worked together to deliver an interactive education program for London Ambulance Service. And the focus was on something called the Clinical Frailty Scale, which I realise I've admitted to put in here. I just sort of assumed everybody would know. But for those who don't, it's a nine point scale from one to nine. And it's a validated tool for the use in people who are over the age of 65. And if your Clinical Frailty Scale is one, which my mum is, it means you're one of the fittest for your age. You're one of those people who's like the queen for a long time. Actually, people joke she was Clinical Frailty Zero, which didn't even exist because you could see her horse riding at the age of goodness knows. And then it goes up to Clinical Frailty Nine. Um, and so it just, it's quite visual, it's quite simple, and you assess people when they are well, not at that acute point, not when they present to A&E, but it's two weeks earlier. How were they? And it just gives you a shorthand language to get a sense of, is this person clinical frailty one, clinical frailty seven? And that immediately tells me something useful. So we want to deliver an education programme around the clinical frailty scale, helping our paramedic colleagues understand and recognise advanced frailty and to help them support end-of-life decision-making. I'm going the wrong way. 
So why? We've used the COVID word. The other word is unprecedented. I think we're supposed to get that into all of our presentations. So we know we're under unpre these are unprecedented times. The NHS is under strain. Our ambulance services are under strain. We've got ambulances queuing up outside the doors of EDs, waiting to hand over their patients and get back out to those in need, but they can't. We've got frail elderly people sitting in corridors. And we can't just keep doing the same thing. We have to find a way to do things differently. As Helen said, they keep telling us there's no new money. But we all really want people to get the right care in the right place at the right time. But I'm not sure that's happening at the moment. Um, evidence tells us about one in three adults admitted through hospital on an acute take are thought to be in their last year of life. But that might not be immediately obvious at the first point that you meet them. So when a crew goes to a house, they may not recognise this. When they're in ED, we may not recognise it. We've got an ageing population. People are getting older, they're getting frailer, they've got more illnesses, more comorbidities. So trying to navigate that complexity and recognise if somebody's got advanced frailty and possibly is approaching their end of life is much more tricky. That's why palliative care liked cancer. Cancer was much more straightforward, whereas advanced frailty it is harder to recognise. And actually, in the acute setting, when a crew is in a house, when you're in ED, the default course of action is often active care. And I think that lots of clinicians, paramedics, pre-hospital clinicians, doctors in hospitals, nurses, when you're so busy and you're under pressure, scoop and run, get people to a place of safety, get them through that system, it is really difficult to pause. Like you were talking about, Kirsty, that desire to pause. You haven't got that headspace to stop and think, hang on a minute, what's happening for this person? So people with long-term conditions are repeatedly admitted to hospital. And actually, that might not be what they want if we took the opportunity to ask them. So we were thinking, can we empower all our teams, including our pre-hospital clinicians, to recognise advanced frailty and then have brave, honest conversations to support shared decision making. So I just want to introduce you to something that's very dear to my heart called the frailty journey. So as I said, I work in a really frail elderly um, hospital uh, with some amazing geriatricians. And we were sitting around in our hospital costa one day talking about the fact that we keep all teaching the same thing. They're teaching end of life. I'm teaching frailty. And we said, right, why don't we join forces, better strength together? And we had a vision that we wanted to teach the whole MDT. We wanted to teach doctors, nurses, physios, OTs, social workers, everybody about frailty from early frailty so when people are quite well and you want to try and keep them well all the way through to them progressing to an end of life so we literally we still got the back of the envelope we were scribbling on and we were coming up with ideas and I kept saying it's that we've got to have the patient we said why don't we take a patient called Mrs B B for Barnet Hospital and have her thread through the care settings, have her going into primary care, into the hospital, in, in and out, like real world, and use that as a premise for teaching. So we weaved her story. And then we also recognised that advanced care planning was one of those things that it's kind of everybody's business, so it kind of becomes nobody's business, and that really bugged me. The hospital thought the community should do it. The community thought the hospital should do it, and anybody it ended up with nobody doing it. And I really wanted to promote this idea that's like a baton in a relay race. When you meet somebody, you start. You've got the starting baton and you do what bit you can. And you may not be able to do it all, but you do what you can. And then you need to securely hand that baton onto the next person. And how do we do that? And then they run a little bit. And then when they get to their limits, because the patient's moved where they are, the baton keeps passing on. So we came up with the Mrs. B Frailty Journey teaching program. We made it interactive. We wanted it really real. So we talk about Mrs. B a lot and we make her a real person. We talk about how she met her husband and the music that she likes. For some reason, we made her a West Ham fan, which still pains me as a Liverpool fan. Um, and we wanted it to feel quite visceral. We used a garden Jenga, the big Jenga games, and all the way through the study day, we take bits of the tower out and we make, we make all the presenters as they're talking, take bits of the tower out until it gets really wobbly. And then I get the fun bit at the end, because I do end of life, that I take the final piece out and give her a bit of a kick and Mrs. B topples over. And the audience gasps, they audibly gasp because they've become actually really quite invested in Mrs. B and what happens to her. So that's Mrs. B's frailty journey. So we did lots. Our journey's been on its own journey. We used to do it pre-pandemic, um, face-to-face, um, a whole day teaching session, did it lots of times. 
And then the Acute Frailty Network picked it up and they said this could be replicated. So they videoed it and they put it online as a Moodle, which apparently means other people can do it. Then the Trust got interested and asked us to do a public facing one, which we did, but we tweaked it and made it a little bit more public facing. Then that C thing happened which meant that we were quite busy and we couldn't really do any education for a little while. But then we came up for air and we were like, we don't want education to stop and everything went online. So we moved Mrs. B online and we'd already killed Mrs. B. So now we put our eyes on Mr. B. And so we gave poor Mr. B, he was recently bereaved. We gave him COVID, we're so horrible. Anyway, um, there were two versions and in one he recovered but at a lower baseline and in the other version, and sadly, Mr. B died. Um, and because we were doing it online, we realized we could reach more people. So instead of it being a local, how many people you could fit in a lecture room, we managed to go regional. We were teaching pan-London IMT trainees, pan-London SDR trainees, and then we set our sights on national. We got a shortlisted for an RCP education award, which we were very proud of. And we're always thinking, what next? How else can we tweak things? So we were plotting our next steps when we were um, approached by a geriatrician in South London. He was working with Health Education England and London Ambulance. And they wanted to embed the use of the clinical frailty scale with London Ambulance. They wanted their crews assessing people while they're in the house, it's the best place to assess it, and identify their clinical frailty and then hand that over to the hospital teams. So rather than, all these things have a really short deadline, don't they? So rather than start their own education, they came to us and said, look, could you do the education element? And we went, yeah, hell yeah. And it was amazing, the collaboration, and actually how you look at the world through your own lens. And um, we got in a room with London Ambulance, which was incredible. And they helped us understand their worldview. And we created a new Mrs. B, but tailored specifically for our paramedic audience. And so we have crisis points, events that happen in her story. And we made these crisis points the point where LAS were called to the house. And the idea was to help LAS understand the clinical frailty scale and then use it to inform their communication and how they communicate frailty to families and to inform their decision making and for them to become more confident with that. That was the aim. That's uh, our original flyer with the Jenga tower and what we sort of cover, what's frailty, how to measure frailty, handing it over, frailty syndromes, all sorts of things. So for the uh, paramedic, um, Mrs. B's story, she starts off quite well, clinical frailty five, not too bad. Uh, she has a trip, isn't particularly injured, can get back up, family get a bit nervous, call 111 who overreact and send an ambulance. But the crew are like, this is fine, you're okay, don't worry, we're just gonna let your GP know so the GP can follow up. GP grabs the baton, starts thinking, oh, she's had a fall. Then event number two, she falls again. This time she can't get back up. Husband has to call 999. It takes a while for them to get there. She has a long line. She's now dehydrated. They have to convey. And we use the clinical frailty to help them inform that decision to convey or not to convey. She gets admitted, fluids, physio, geriatric clinic follow-up. She's now less well. She's more dependent. She's more frail, clinical frailty six. Then she has another event. Poor Mrs. B was so mean to Mrs. B. So she becomes confused, has another fall, hits her head. Um, but this time she's on a DOAC, a blood thinning drug. So the crew turn up and they feel they have to convey. Blood thinner, hit head, in you go. She has a long admission. She gets delirious. She's got a pneumonia. She gets deconditioned, pressure sores. So again, that baton is passed on and somebody grabs it and says, right, things have changed. Let's have more of a conversation. And so she goes home with a QDS package of care and an EPAC urgent care plan, saying she'd kind of like to avoid hospital unless she really had to. Now clinical frailty seven, eight. She goes home, we pass the baton on to the GP, GP goes to see her, things are continuing to change, deteriorating, mainly in bed, lots of infections, reduced oral intake. You see where this is going. Um, clinical frailty eight, they refer to community palliative care. And then her final event, she's chesty, she's not getting better, family panic, call an ambulance. Paramedics en route are able to read her advanced care planning on the electronic record. They can see that the hospice are involved. They've got a picture before they walk in that house. They figure out she's clinical frailty eight. They figure out about some of these conversations and so they use that as their framework. And together with Mr. B and with the family, they decide not to convey. She's symptomatic, she's chested, they call the hospice. We give some advice about what meds to give and we send out a hospice at home support team. And Mrs. B dies peacefully at home. This is when I would knock over the Tower of Jenga, but I couldn't carry it with me. So that's Mrs. B. So we've now delivered it three times, which actually um, we'd like to have done it more, but it has been really challenging. The, the world is busy and 
The, um, at one point, we weren't sure because the uh, London Ambulance have levels of alert as to how busy they are, and they were on, they've been on red alert, I think, for quite a while. But actually, they said, let's just do it anyway, because one thing I would say to you is the paramedic audience are like sponges. They love learning. And they will come, she said, even if they're not on duty, they will come. We've had crews sitting in their ambulances joining webinars saying, we might get called away, but we're here for now. Um, so we've delivered the session three times with a PDSA model, getting feedback, tweaking it. We got um, an ED consultant to talk, a GP perspective, changing the slide content, constantly evaluating and improving it to really make sure it's meeting that need. We do polls in the middle of the webinar that talk about their confidence. So we can see that their confidence with CSF at the beginning is low and then it's higher at the end. They're fed back that they feel much more confident now in how they have conversations. It's all about communication and about those decisions to convey or not to convey. And as Helen said, there's no new money. We have to save money somewhere in order to do all the other things we want to do. So we're saving the money. We just want it back. <laughs> whether, we, whether it'll come back to us, I don't know. But we're trying to get people to get care in the right place. So we've still got lots of hopes and ideas of things next. So th that big collaborative group with London Ambulance, we want to do more sessions. We want to do some face-to-face, -face, deeper dive, because it's a two-hour webinar, and they're still like, they want to know more. We think this can be done outside of London if people want to replicate it. We've now had um, reciprocal arrangements where our team have gone out with crews. Those crews have come out with us. I'm due to go on my ride along. I'm so excited at the thought of going out. I became a doctor because I watched too much casualty and now I'm going on a ride along. <laughs> Um, the Frailty Journey Group, we've also had lots of ideas, so now realising you can tweak it, we've done a version for practice nurses, because we want them to do advanced care planning. We're trying to do one for surgeons, that's good fun. Um, and then we've had an epiphany recently, we're going to be brave enough and we're going to do a Mrs B uh, Oncology one as well. Um, and we're trying to take it to the national training, and Cliff, one of my colleagues, um, is from Africa, so he's taking this internationally. So we've got lots of ideas and lots of enthusiasm for taking it further. So in conclusion, uh, we think that multidisciplinary education is absolutely essential. It needs to be interactive, it needs to be fun, um, but we think it can have system-wide benefits, that if you improve people's confidence, it really will impact the outcomes. And we think what was made this so successful was that collaboration, hospices, hospitals, geriatricians, palliative care, London Ambulance, ED, GPs, you name it. We have physios, OTs, all sorts of people in our faculty. So I think working together is the key to producing excellent end-of-life care. I just want to credit all the other people who aren't here. I'm up here taking all the glory, but it wasn't all me. There's a whole lot of other people who really helped make this happen. And I think hopefully I come within time. And I think now we all do questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely brilliant. Um, huge thank you to all of our, our five speakers. Um, all fascinating stories, completely different, um, but great examples of collaboration and partnerships and, and what you can get from that. We've got about six minutes, so um, if anyone's got any questions, we'd love to hear them. So if I could ask the speakers perhaps to come here, I'll go over to the lectern, and then if I could ask all of you to uh, submit your questions on Slido, then that would be great. So, Helen, <laughs> the first question is for you. Um, you mentioned data and the importance of data um, in your presentation. How successful were you in achieving consistent data across the different hospices and then maintaining that? Um, I think we were successful, but we just had to keep it quite simple. So, you know, how many beds, how many days, how many community contacts, um, just looking at Rachel, see what, but you know, what was the consistent data that we knew we all had and that actually if it was challenged, I think it's really important if you're challenged on it, you are able to evidence it. And I think what's happening now, certainly some of you might be on strategic clinical networks um, and they've made some money available, certainly in the south, to actually look at KPIs, data, systems, so how they can support hospices to come out with better data that can give you um, outcomes that commissioners, commissioners need, NHS England need, but actually are useful to hospices as well, I think in terms of activity, performance and quality. So we kept it simple, uh, <coughs> but we made sure it was quality data. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Any more questions? Hi, I can see one at the back. Do we have a roving mic? Could we use one? Hang on a sec, we'll bring you a mic just so. Thanks so much. Just a uh, question for Joe. Just on the frailty score, or problems because I know you mentioned about over 65, and there's a lot of patients that we're caring for that are under 65. So, have you had any problems using a certain frailty score? I think the Rockwood Clinical Frailty Scale is only validated in the over 65 population and you're right, there is a huge number of people who are frail and under the age of 65. I think they're working to develop a validated tool under that age, but it's not. And at the beginning of um, COVID, Clinical Frailty School was used as part of that decision making framework for access to ITU beds and it came under criticism because um, there was concern that it was being used in an under 65 population, it was being used in the population with learning disabilities and autism, and it's not valid in those populations. And I was really fearful, having spent so much time investing in the clinical frailty scale, that it would go the same way as the Liverpool Care Pathway, that it would get tainted, and that it would be seen as being, you know, this sort of... So I think we do have to use it in the validator population only. But I think the principles still apply and are still quite useful. It's still a very much performance status based scale. So I think we have got other scales like Karnofsky and the Oaks measures that are useful. But no, at the moment, Rockwood is 65 only and not for learning disabilities and not for autism and the particular groups. But for the groups it's validated for, it's incredibly predictive of outcomes. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Joe, another one for you. Um, so Laura's asking, it might be early days, but have you got any evidence that the paramedics have demonstrated a change in practice? Reconvey to hospital for end of life, informal feedback, audits, anything like that? Yeah, I was trying to get the data for that and hoping to have it for the presentation, but we haven't managed to get it yet. I mean, yes, so there is some evidence that the use of clinical frailty has increased. It's really difficult to say is this one thing the cause for the reduced number of conveyances? Because I think that everybody everywhere is doing projects aiming to reduce conveyances. So I don't think we can claim all of that success. But certainly the use of clinical frailty has increased across the um, London ambulance, which the fact that they're using it is the first step. And then seeing how will it um, um, impact the outcomes will be the next step. But it's hard to tease it apart. Brilliant. And um, we're sticking with you, Joe. <laughs> frailty is obviously a really hot topic. Um, so thinking, as Rebecca, thinking about developing a frailty service, do you think hospice staff need specific training as confidence levels can be low? If so, is there specific tra training that you would recommend? And do you think input from geriatricians is essential? Yes, 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 yes. I, um, I think it is a, it's a different condition and you need to understand how to communicate it. So patients and families don't recognise it. It's a little bit like we know you can have a heart failure diagnosis where the prognostic is poorer than some cancers. But if you say cancer to somebody, they'll often say, what's my prognosis? How long have I got? Heart failure doesn't have the same. Mm. Frailty's the same. When I grew up, it was not a medical term at med school. For me, it was not a medical term. So I've just got this image in my head of somebody who's frail. It's only recently that we have medicalized the phrase and it's got medical implications. And I don't think the healthcare profession know that. And Joe Public certainly doesn't. So I think one of the features of our frailty journey is trying to explain how to communicate frailty. And it's that diminishing resilience that, I, like I say, people don't have the bounce back ability. So something that seems small has a huger impact. And it's that cumulative effect. And that's what we need to learn how to communicate. Um, and I think that when you're trying to do advanced care planning, people think they can live forever and trying to communicate with families as to why that's not. So I think doing frailty education for our workforce is absolutely essential. Um, obviously, where I am, we make everybody go on the frailty journey. You'd be welcome to come. It's a free study day if you want to come down to Barnet Hospital. Next one's first of Feb. Everybody's very welcome. <laughs> um, but I think talk to your geriatricians. It, it depends where you work. The majority of our geriatricians are incredibly palliatively minded, but not all are. So know your geriatricians and develop relationships with them would be my tip. 
Thank you. Um, and that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. It's been such a, a, a fantastic session with four absolutely brilliant presentations. So if you could just join me in thanking our presenters, first of all. And now it's refreshments, I think, in Hall 2. Thank you all very much for coming.